first item on the agenda is adjust adjustments to agenda. Are there any adjustments? Charlie? No. no. Okay. Uh, the next item is approval of February 14th, 1995 school board minutes. Is there any corrections? There was a correction Charlie. brought to the attention of the superintendent's secretary under superintendent's report. I'm listed as the person who gave report on two issues. Uh, update on construction project and budget timelines. I did not give those. I believe the superintendent did. Okay. Correct. Any, anything else? Okay, the minutes stand approved with those corrections. Uh, the next item is comments by high school representatives. Do we have any? Oh. Hi. Good evening. We've had a number of victories and near victories with CAPE extracurriculars lately. Boys and girls swimming both finished third in states, girls basketball finished second in Western Maine, and our one act play, which won first in, regional, in the regional competition, was commended by judges on both acting and technical excellence. And at last Saturday's debate meet, Capers won 13 out of 26 awards. Now we're between sports seasons and have begun filling out our course selections for next year. Since the stretch of time between February and April vacation is known for being long and demanding, the SAC has come up with a few ideas to make life a little more interesting around the high school. The first is the scavenger hunt, which will be held through the 29th, and the second is the first annual spring semi-formal, sponsored jointly by the freshman, sophomore, and junior classes and scheduled for March 31st. It's, it'll be the first dance that we've had since October and should be a lot of fun. And now I'll turn the mic over to Pat. Well, my name is Patrick Cotter. I'm a senior at the high school. Seniors right now are in the wonderful stage of waiting for college um, replies, either good or bad. Uh, the juniors are getting ready for the SAT coming up if they already haven't taken it last month. Uh, project graduation is trying to get figure out a time that we're actually going to leave the uh, high school after we graduate. Um, the seniors are still trying to come up with a list of things that we talked about last subcommittee meeting for Mr. D on things we can do on campus when we have freeze. Uh, the, Frost, the Frosh are working on um, some fundraisers, one of them which is a car wash and another is candy sales. Uh, the sophomores are trying to find some advertising for mugs they're gonna sell with names. They're um, those insulated mugs that you have in your car. They're gonna sell them for about five bucks. And the juniors are getting ready to finish up their second term paper of the year which is, for most, in most cases, is for social studies. Any questions? No. Thank you. Middle school representatives? Hi, my name is Ashley Earnshaw, and Amy couldn't make it tonight, so I'm just taking her place for tonight. Um, the Middle School Student Council this year has decided for their main fundraiser to do the Humanities t-shirt sale instead of the magazine sale, which we have done in previous years. And we were just going to try it this year and see how much profit we make and then be, be able to compare it in future years so we can decide better next year which one we want to do. Um, the talent show is going to be Thursday, March 23rd. There's going to be two shows since there, it was so crowded last time, one at 3.30 and one at 7. And this year they're going to have an admission for $1. The Parents Association is having a dance this Friday at 7 at the St. Maximilian Church in Scarborough. And the juniors put on a dance for us last Friday. And <coughs> they were making money for their prom, and it, I think they made it a good amount. The eighth graders get their MEA scores sometime this week and we have our course selection sheets and the high school put on a freshman orientation Monday for the parents and student, students. And now I'll turn it over to Annika. All right, um, on March 21st, the seventh grade science students are gonna be having an open house in their classrooms from 6.30 to 8.30. And um, there is a meeting on March 28th for sixth grade parents at seven o'clock in the middle school library to discuss Chewankee. The fifth and sixth graders will be having a social at Happy Wheels on Wednesday, March 15th. The admission is $3. And um, 
The middle school winter sports seasons are finishing up and pretty soon the spring sports will be starting. It should be right around the beginning of April. Any questions? No. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to communications. Anybody have any communications? Charlie? Um, just to let the board as a whole know that on their December 7th meeting, they approved the Technology Steering Committee's recommendation and report and the establishment of a permanent Technology Steering Committee that has met as of Mar on March 6th and elected Gary Lenoy as the chair. Um, they talked about the update on the budget, the construction update about the wiring, et cetera. It's tried to set some goals for the rest of the year and um, at their next meeting, are going to look at staff purchase plans and having an Apple representative there. And also talked a little bit about the curriculum aspect of, of, of technology and uh, possibly looking at a research strand and a process-oriented approach coming out of this committee. Sounds great. Do you want to talk about that or should I? I'll bring you that one. Okay. And under communications, um, received a notice from the Department of Education that uh, we have a semifinalist for Teacher of the Year this year in the Cape Elizabeth School System. It's Steve Connolly, who is uh, a teacher at the Cape Elizabeth Middle School. We certainly are very proud of him and I understand that a group of parents actually are the ones who uh, spearheaded the nomination. I think that's really high praise when um, in the sense of people that you're very close to put the package together. We'll know the process calls for some visitations to the school. Um, as board members, you may be contacted. Uh, I certainly expect to be as uh, also a superintendent, but congratulations to Steve and to the middle school. It's, it's wonderful to have a nomination like this. Um, I, sh I guess I should congratulate the whole system. Yeah, I'd just like to echo that um, we are very proud of Steve, and I did talk to one of the parents who was instrumental in, in uh, getting his name put forward for this process. And you know, one one thing that she said that I thought was very nice for the for the whole system was that there's so many teachers who deserve this honor. Um, you know, but it's nice it's nice to single Steve out. But she did point out there are a lot of other teachers who are just as deserving of the system, and that is true. So this is a great honor. And, we certainly wish him luck and, luck and we'll do everything we can to help him advance. Could I just comment? My sister went through this process. She was a semi-finalist and a finalist about two years ago and it's work now for the, for the mm -hmm. candidates. Mm -hmm. It actually is a considerable amount of work in preparation and presentations that they have to do. Mm -hmm. So. Well, let's wish him well. That's right. One other communication. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jane Amro, who was scheduled to be at our board meeting um, last month, I guess, gosh, is it? Yep. Yeah, it was, it was just last month. Uh, naturally, with the legislators uh, in session so much day and night, I gather, um, she regrets that she can't be here today. She thought she might be able to. Uh, however, I suggested that we might keep some time open on our next Tuesday's budget meeting workshop, the 21st, and also we're scheduled for the 28th. And uh, she said she would try to make one of those dates, so I will get back in touch. Uh, but I wanted to let you know that she still has this in mind and would like to come in and talk about the various uh, agenda items that she's aware of, funding being a, a principal one. Actually, speaking of that, um, I, I was wondering if everybody received a copy of the Rosser Commission report. Did everybody get one of those in the mail? Just I'm week? not sure if they sent it to everybody, no. did they? Because I think no. they... They, I know they sent one to me, yes, yeah. and one to the board chair, but... Did and I got copies okay. for you. Ah, that's right. I had the draft. Um, well, I'm going... I, we, we can just make these available to people if mm -hmm. they'd like to take a look. I haven't had a chance to read mine, but as soon as I do, I'd be happy to share it. I'm sure we'll we see if we can... We can certainly <coughs> make copies in, and perhaps I can get a few more, but... Um, okay. It's, it's very happy. interesting and yeah. very equitable if it could be passed. It will, in fact, be discussed a lot. In fact, another communication that we distributed at our last budget workshop was meeting tomorrow night with, at South Portland also on this topic. So there's going to be a lot of discussion, uh, and I'm sure discussion in the legislature 
also about it. So we'll get you copies for you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. I just want to make note that uh, the <clears throat> Mr. Richardson and the high school jazz ensemble attended the Berkeley Festival. Mm. Um, I haven't heard no. many of the details. Uh, do you have any details? I, I'm they had a strong performance of the need to yeah, it's great to see oh, our it's musical good to hear, groups. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yep. Nice. Anything else? Okay, moving on to superintendent's report. And I've left my MEA. I took it out this morning talking to somebody. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and I, this is. I noticed that there was an editorial in today's paper on the MEAs and, oh, thank you. And I have, in fact, um, um, talked again to Lyle, who will be at our board meeting next month to try to uh, put some of this together for you. Um, one of the things that he's a little concerned about is that there are some anomalies in the way in which these things have been scored. Anytime you change the, um, the rules, if you will, there will be some things happen that, that are going to be hard to explain, and he's still looking for explanations from the State Department on some of that. For instance, when the individual student scores go home, there will be some percentages tied to this business about distinguished, advanced, et cetera. And it is possible to have the same percentage score and to have a student who act, one student will have the, appear to have the same score and will be listed in the advanced and another one with the same score may be listed in basic. And uh, he was pointing that out to me and, and the answer as we understand it right now is that there are some questions that are considered more difficult than others and that because these are really based on uh, eight to 10 questions, some of those kinds of things can make a difference. Um, I just want to remind parents, uh, as well as teachers, that this is the first year for this. So as these go home, there'll be individual questions about it, some of which we won't be able to answer because it is a new scoring guide and, in fact, the State Department is still uh, working on it, the people who are, in fact, uh, who have the contract to develop the, uh, the test are still working on it. Uh, I hope people take these individual student scores in, in the spirit of recognizing that this is a, um, a, a, you know, a new attempt to raise the standards, uh, change the conversation a little bit, uh, introduce an, um, more of the open-ended kinds of questions, which are admittedly more difficult. Um, and as we understand it better, we will certainly try to give both you as board members and certainly uh, parents and students themselves some answers. Uh, I suspect the youngsters are a little nervous about this. I think they'll be going out next week. And um, they, went out today. they did go out today. Okay. Uh, I hope that uh, anybody who has questions, it'll be interesting. You know, certainly feel free to call me. I don't have any answers, but if you have a question, I'd be happy to discuss it. Um, but also, I will be keeping in touch with the buildings to see what kind of questions come in and, and what the reactions are. Um, as we pointed out earlier, our eighth grade scores look very, if you look at the old way of scoring them, they look very much the way they have. The difference is that injecting this sense of some of the questions being more difficult, open-endedness being more difficult, and also uh, sort of rank ordering students. Uh, what the effect of that will be, I don't know. I'll be very interested in any feedback that you get from parents or if any of you have. Anybody have any greater? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, you know, what you hear. Questions? Did you notice anything in going through this? I was very impressed by the writing because we've, yeah. we've kind of concentrated that in the last three or four years because our writing scores have tended to be down and to see that actually 67% um, of our students place advanced or distinguished. So it shows a vast improvement in that area and only 6% were in the novice and 27% were in the basic. That's very impressive considering. The other thing you will notice in looking at those is that um, there are notably more students, not only at the writing, but at the reading, in the advanced and distinguished, reading not so much distinguished, but at the advanced, than is the case in the mathematics. 
section. Uh, so far, I don't have a real good answer to that one, but my understanding is that each of these divisions, that is the reading and the writing and the mathematics, had different advisory groups, and when they were setting up the uh, ways in which they would interpret the definitions of distinguished advance, in other words, establishing a cutoff point. Um, some of those cutoff points are a little different depending on the subject, um, and therefore it is conceivable you have a strong student in math um, who is uh, actually in the basic because of the way in which they have uh, determined that. But again, those are, those are issues we don't know the answers to yet, and I would just remind people this is, a, is the first year of the change and a lot of adjustments, I'm sure, one way or the other. I, I do think that sometime when we do have more information, it's awfully early and there are a lot of questions that probably can't be answered for, for quite a while, but I think it would be helpful to have some kind of forum in which parents, I don't, I'm not suggesting a particular forum, but somewhere where parents can ask questions and get an idea of what these questions are and that kind of thing. And I, I think it's premature for that, but as we have this and then we're going to have the 11th grade and the 4th grade, there are going to be a lot of parents, I think, and, and students interested in you know, how they placed where they did. So um, I think we should be thinking about that as we get more. Well, when you deal with open-ended questions, as a former teacher of English, I certainly know well the difficulty of explaining uh, with absolute finality to a student mm. why this paper is an A paper and why this paper is a B paper and why this paper is a C paper. Absolute finality is hard to arrive at when you're dealing with essay answers. <coughs> Now, I do know that um, through the, particularly the work that's been done on the um, writing sample and the open-ended questions that they've been using, uh, they certainly have come up with some good rubrics that mm -hmm. give them guidance to that. It's not, a, not intended to be, uh, nor is it totally subjective, but sometimes it's hard to be uh, totally clear about those things. Anything else? Um, update and construction project, uh, I think Sue is here. Um, I can just tell you in general that we continue to be on budget, if a little behind schedule. Um, the major issue, those of you on the building committee are aware of, we have found additional structural issues in Pond Cove. I think Sue will probably address those in her update. Um, yes, we met the other day to do an update of, of what's going to transpire in terms of phase three of the MOVE construction project. And because of all of the reinforcements needed in Area A, um, they've decided that definitely is not going to be ready until fall. And Area A would be what was this year the second grade wing, prior to this year the fourth grade wing, but the upper end of the Pond Cove School. Um, because of the extensive renovation needed will not be available until fall. So having said that, having realized that, we have had to take a different tact in terms of who's going to move in the next phase. Um, <clears throat> we met last week and determined that the contractors would concentrate on Area B, formerly the first grade wing and a completion date for Area B would be um, around April 2nd. And what that means is, is that Area B would be ready for inspections at that time. And the week of the 3rd, April 3rd through April 7th, um, code enforcement, fire department, and those inspections would occur. That's if everything is on time. Um, the architect would come in and do a punch list um, the week of the 3rd to the 7th. Um, the week of the 7th to the 12th, D.L. Poulin would come in and complete um, the punch list. And then we, the owner, would go in and floor. Okay? Um, that's a little bit different than what we did in Phase 2, which is the completion of Area C or the Lunt building. Um, they tried to do the floors when lots of work was still going on in the building, and consequently the floors were not done correctly and have had to be redone and will continue to be redone over the summer. So we are going to have our people do the floors. 
We have told them that we will not do it unless we have the building. That means all the inspections are complete, the painters are out of there, um, where we can go in and clean, um, seal the floors, put two coats of wax down, um, and have them really done right so that they don't have to be redone this summer. If all that occurs, we should be done that by April 14th. And um, it has been determined that the fourth grade will be moving in to that section. In that section are eight classrooms. There are seven fourth grades that will be moving over in one special ed space. So that takes care of all eight spaces in that building. What that means for the middle school is that at that point we will empty the link, which is the connector between the gym and the 1930s building. And we will also vacate a fifth and a sixth grade classroom that we will be adjacent to the new elevator in the 1930s buildings. And those will be, those <clears throat> folks in those two areas will be either put into the vacated rooms by the fourth grade in the 30s building or into portables. And Ms. Hutton has those worked out. I don't know the exact particulars, but it does fit. Um, what this means is that we will not have to move the third grade portables to the middle school, which we had thought about doing at one time. So it really simplifies the move. This makes it, um, this seems to be the logical move at this point. It's the least disruptive. And so that's what will happen as soon as everyone goes on vacation. Um, everything is supposed to be packed and ready to go by the end of the day on um, April 14th and um, that move will occur over the next three to four days. That's part of what's going to happen. Okay, the other part that's going to be completed at that point is area um, D. And area D is the new gymnasium and the new cafetorium. And <clears throat> when I say complete, I probably should qualify that a little bit. Not completely complete, but complete enough for us to utilize the space. What that means is that all Pond Cove students, one through four, will eat in the cafetorium. The, they will eat on cement floors, as the new furniture won't be here. And they will eat box lunches until probably mid-May, when the kitchen is complete. And then, at that point, the middle school students will start to use the cafetorium, and the Pond Cove students will be using it as well, but not until the kitchen is done. Okay. One of the reasons for us not putting down the floor, A, we probably couldn't have it done by that time frame, and B, we don't have the new furniture. And sliding the old uh, chairs and tables around on the new surface would destroy it before we even got started into the new year. So it makes a lot of sense not having to put the floor down before we start to utilize the space. And we have had that cleared through the code enforcement officer so long as we seal the floor and we will be doing that. Um, moving on into May, if things go according to schedule in May, around May 10th to 15th, when the cafetorium or the kitchen is ready, um, the middle school students will start to eat lunch there. And they may, the administrative area at Pond Cove may move into the new middle school administrative area. And, and that is a little bit fuzzy at this time. There's no hurry for us to do that. There's no pressure on us to do that before the end of the year. But that would free up spaces for the contractor to get into so that they could start work before the close of school. So that's basically where we are at this point. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> hope I have the answers. Yes. Um, if you empty out the connector at the middle school over April vacation, will kids still be walking through there to get to the middle school lunch, or they'll go outside and around? They will have to go outside and around. We still will have the walkway going directly to the cafeteria. Um, the other entryway we'll have is from um, the front of the 1930s building will be reopened up for students in the 1930s building. So yes, they will have to do that. And will there be classes going on in the 1930s building also? Yes. We're not clearing out all. No, we're only vacating two classrooms in the 1930s buildings, the two that are adjacent, one fifth grade and one sixth grade adjacent to where the new elevator will be. Okay. And we're working out new e fire egress routes and so forth, and all of this will be approved by, or has already 
been discussed with the fire chief. When you said the Pond Cove kids would be eating on the floor in the cafeteria, do you no. mean with the old furniture? With the old furniture, <laughs> yes. Picnic sticks. With the old furniture. Yeah. Carla. Um, with the ceiling of the floor, am I remembering accurately that we couldn't seal, like, for instance, the area that you called Area B, because that would affect the laying down of the tile? This will be something that is accepted by the contractor okay. who guarantee, you know, adhesion to the okay. floor with you know, whatever they put down. Because that's be a different material than yes. the tiles. Okay. Charlie? Beth actually asked my question, but I, just a clarification of why the floor will not be going down in the Capitorium is because at our last uh, building committee meeting, they weren't quite sure that the Capitorium would be done by April. So the, the uh, movable equipment subcommittee decided to put back into our movable equipment budget, so when it goes out to bid, the cafetorium furnishings, which would then make it more competitive. So that's why the equipment is not gonna arrive, that's why the floor is not going down. We felt if it did, if for some reason that it was made available that we had enough uh, uh, tables and chairs and um, the, the tables that we had at Pong Cove to to meet the need for the rest of the year. It would be better to start out the new year with everything complete with new furnishing. Mm -hmm. I think too, the grounds being as muddy as they are at this point, um, anything that we can do later will look that much better when we start school in the fall because the mud coming into the buildings now is, is really pretty incredible. The kids will not be using the entryways, though, that go into the new part of the building. When you say that D connector is ready, it's just from the interior? Or is that whole front way going to be ready, too? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I would say it isn't, because there's a great deal of, of, of outside grading that's going to be needed to be done there. So my guess is they probably, you wouldn't enter that way. But I'm, I'm not absolutely sure on that. And that, that's a good question, and I'll find out the answer to that. I have a question. Um, I've had a couple of people ask me about the flooring of the cafeteria, and non Pond Cove parents have heard that it's carpeted. And um, could you explain to the public what it is? Probably Charlie can explain it better. It's, it's, it's sort of a cross between a VCT tile and a carpet. Um, it not, has the appearance of carpeting, but it has the durability and um, density of, of the tile. And it washes. And it washes. It washes. washes. Yes. It, and it's also very good acoustically, and that is auditorium space as well, so it'll keep the noise down. It's a very big, big room. And it actually is costing us considerably more than the tile, but it has other advantages because of the space, what it's going to be used for. Thank you. It has the durability and, and, and uh, facility of tile, but it has the appearance of carpet. Well, people have heard the word carpet and wondered why anybody would put a carpet and in And they the actually are, are, are pieces Square. that can be taken up and replaced. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're like squares. And it will have a pattern to it by the way the squares are laid out. And it's all one color. <laughs> but it will have a different pattern to it by the way it's laid. And, and planning for this, as Scott reminded, we, ma reminded me, we have purchased a machine that is perfect for cleaning this type of surface. Thank you. Carl? Um, through all of this, is Pond Cove going to continue to have phys ed in the high school gym? The new gym will be ready after mm -hmm. April vacation. After April vacation. And is the middle school gym, I sort of missed that in there, is the middle school gym affected? Are they going to be having? It is not going to be affected until at least the 1st of June. So they will maintain having use of the middle school gym. And that, at, at first, we thought that wasn't going to be the case, but there's no real advantage for them to get in there. So we will maintain that until the end of the school year. Keith? Does the uh, structural problems have any budget impact? Um, the, that's one thing I would want to point out. We have a small article coming out in the Courier referencing that and also had some contact with the Portland paper. I think they're going to try to do an article as an update article. I would like the public to understand that we have found in, uh, particularly in the old wing, 
uh, Pond Cove. That's the one we're talking about here, not being uh, fully ready until fall. Uh, the one which originally was a kindergarten wing and it's been a second grade wing and a fourth grade wing, but the one that's closest to Scott Day Road. Uh, one of the things that can happen in a renovation is that when you dig into the building, you discover things that you really wouldn't discover any other way unless you had some serious accident. And uh, what we found is that there were a number of failures in the roof timbers, failures that hadn't yet become so bad that there was imminent uh, crash possibility, but enough of them so that over time there would have been a serious problem. In addition, we found that the interior walls were not properly braced or connected. And furthermore, they were constructed of cinder block. And cinder block was a material, you know, that building was built right after World War II. And I, uh, although old enough to remember World War II, I certainly don't know much about the construction <laughs> trades then. Um, but at any rate, the, uh, uh, I do remember that there was a rush to get a lot of stuff done at that time. And, and regular materials were still going through what they call the war conversion. Um, so I don't know whether they used cinder blocks because they were standard uh, uh, materials at the time. I believe they were. Uh, but what happens with them, they dry out over time. And what we've discovered is some of those walls with very little pressure just fell over and crumbled. And in fact, we recall that we had a blackboard fall off one of those walls a year before the referendum. I remember we, we were talking about that. We thought perhaps because it had somehow not been properly um, anchored and we didn't really know why, it just did. We think now it was because the wall was crumbling behind it and it was loosened in that process. Uh, I don't certainly want to alarm anybody. I don't think that that building was about to fall down on children, but uh, it does emphasize the fact that we were not crying wolf with this referendum. There was, in fact, plenty of evidence for us to understand that these buildings were in poor shape and needed thorough renovation. This is more than we had expected. To answer your other question about the financial impact, we've been carrying a budget with a lot of contingency because, of course, the architects and their structural engineer had done quite a lot of pre-work looking at the condition of the buildings as best they could and estimating from their age and other exterior signs that there was likely to be um, a number of problems when we got into them. So, so far we're okay. In other words, the contingency we've carried has allowed us to take care of these issues. We are still nervous about what we're going to find as we dig into the middle school. And this is one reason why we have been so conservative in talking about technology for one thing and talking about some of the other things that movable furniture, casework in the classrooms, uh, and we're holding off making decisions on those things until we get through these uh, discovery processes. I also want to emphasize that the building committee, um, and certainly all of us in the central office are contacts with the architects, we have authorized in every way the necessity for structural engineers to check the buildings thoroughly. Uh, clearly, people are reading about Portland High School, um, understanding that renovations give you an opportunity to discover what may be long-standing problems that you didn't know about, and we are taking full advantage of that opportunity. Charlie? Just to address a little bit about that, and that does, that does render some additional costs by having some of the structural work continue to be processed, but it's better to upfront it now than to get into the Portland situation. Yeah, and let's just be clear, it's still all within the it's budget. It's all within We're the not, budget. Nobody's going out asking for any more. No. <laughs> the contingency fund, it was about 330000 and uh, and we're in pretty good condition with the contingency fund, with the project about half done. But like Connie has alluded that the, we haven't got into the 30s building yet. Maybe Hopefully it's better constructed than the uh, 1948 building. I think the 1948 building is probably the, the worst constructed building in the whole facility. Well, it, it, we just, just the way it was constructed, yeah, the we materials didn't realize, it used. Yeah. And Let's hope that it's so at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you all set? Everybody had all their questions answered? Great. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. Um, moving on. The next item is simply uh, reminding the board that we do, for, and for any staff member or anybody who's interested, this is a time of year when we 
the athletic fee and the co-curricular committees meet. These are uh, the composition of those committees is listed in our teacher contract. It's a yearly review of the positions or the fees attached to them. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to update them. That is, sometimes there are positions that we no longer need. Other positions have become more complicated. People will be requesting for more hours. In some cases, just the opposite would be true. Um, and we've had some discussions in our teacher negotiations about issues that will be affected by that review. And I've given you the dates that those are scheduled uh, for Athletic Fee Committee on Thursday, April 6th at 3.15, and co-curricular for Monday, April 3rd at 3.15. Okay? Okay. And the last item on my list is I included in your packet a copy of the National Science Foundation grant that we have uh, submitted along with Scarborough and South Portland. I gave you some information about that in your agenda notes. It's a fairly wordy grant. Um, it follows an awful lot of the, uh, uh, for instance, there's a certain rubric you have to follow. Um, and I want, I think one thing that's important in talking to people about this, I should emphasize, this is a planning grant. In other words, it's a grant to plan. So even though it's about science and mathematics, it doesn't say a whole lot about science and mathematics. It talks about the purposes of staff development, the ways in which the three school districts have talked about getting together, the methodology we will use to some degree, vision issues, common needs, and um, those are all elements that are laid out by the this particular grant formula. Um, and because it was long and complicated, because there are always very interesting issues when you get three districts working together too. And this is a new exercise for us to come together in something as structured as this. We have informal contacts, but nothing where we actually were looking for this type of, of structure. I did engage the Center for Educational um, Services to help us with this um, and uh, found that that was certainly the only way we were gonna get it done. I'd be happy to answer questions. You do have uh, also some letters of support. I really appreciate uh, uh, Michael Roy, Mark Foray, former member of this board. Um, Michael is a member of our school building committee. Um, I think we have a couple of other Kate people, Gail Adsett, our science chair. You see some people from the university here, some people that Scarborough and South Portland um, had done some work with. So it's. Those are the kinds of things that, that put the package together. Um, the initial grant for $50,000, a lot of that, most of that would be chewed up uh, with staff development and with hiring somebody to help us administer it. The exact outlines of that really aren't carved in concrete. We would, if, if in fact we do get the grant, we will sit down and renegotiate some of that. But that is the way in which we are actually going forward with it at the moment. And um, let me see. The potential is uh, up to uh, uh, four, for over a period of three years, could be as much as a million dollars. I don't know with the climate of budgetary restraint that seems to be hitting Washington, I, I'm, that, that may take an instant nosedive, but I, I still think it's worth the work. For us, it's really important to try to get more staff development funds from outside. We simply are too small a district to do all that we have to do. So if we don't win this, we'll keep trying. I, th I think you've answered my question. To, uh, it looked like 50% of the funds are gonna go to a specific person, and I just, if that's negotiable, I just- It is very yeah, I know it's a planning grant, yeah. but the planning grant should also involve the school districts and, and more release time and that kind of stuff. Right, no, it does, in fact, uh, I discussed that with the South Portland and Scarborough administrators who were involved, and frankly, the, um, the constraints of the grant sometimes require you to put things into, you know, cast them in, in a mold that they're familiar with, but we have a very clear understanding. In fact, CAPE is listed as a fiscal agent. Therefore, we will be hiring in conjunction with the other two districts, obviously, not just us, everybody that's involved with this. So that's really just something to get us started. Any other questions? When, when do we expect to hear about this? I believe by June, but I am not 
it's, this is, um, I've never done anything through the NSF, so I really can't tell you. Well, reading through the letters, I must say the most eloquent ones were certainly from, you know, people connected to Cape Elizabeth, so. <laughs> Well, think I think so? we're the hungriest in <laughs> Maybe so, the most desperate. But they were very good. I thought they were very good, thoughtful. Yes, letters. they were. They were very nice. Appreciate that. Very um, helpful. This is this is a new venture for us, so we will see what happens. I would I would want to emphasize that the meetings that we've had with teachers and administrators from both districts, Scarborough and South Portland, have been extremely cordial. And I think the teachers themselves have enjoyed the meetings. Uh, there's some contacts being made, some people who knew each other, but realized the possibilities of, of um, really sharing. I was really impressed with the openness um, from all three groups. One meeting we had in Scarborough in their Beacon Grant funded uh, discovery room, or I'm not sure if that's what they call it, but um, really, uh, people anxious to show us what they were doing, to share their, what they've learned, so that whether we get the money or not, this will you know, be one of those occasions when some bridging is going on and we will try hard to do it. It will be much more productive if we have some support. Mm. Uh, they were very clear that having had the Beacon Grant, uh, we met, met with their two coordinators, the math and the science people who work directly there, uh, the ways in which they see that is absolutely fundamental to getting things done. And we, we really know that, but at the same time, it's hard to come up with that kind of money right. uh, out of the regular budget. Plus, they've been supported by a lot of, of um, programs, um, experiences, national sharing through the National Science Foundation. I mean, it isn't just hiring two people who know math and science to come in and help. There are, there's a whole structure there that we will be t have an opportunity to share. Well, I hope we get it. Me too. That's okay. it. Moving on to school board subcommittees and reports. Um, the first is school building committee, which I think we basically covered under Sue's report, unless somebody has something to add. I would only add that the, the building uh, movable equipment subcommittee of that of the building committee is meeting two times this month to kind of conclude that part of the process. We pretty much what we come up with the budget and, and the things that we're going to buy is, is within budget. A couple of interesting things have come to light. One is we did go out to bid on the telephone system and the computer wiring and that has come in under under bid which is which is actually to our advantage. And if this is hopefully the direction that the rest of that, that budget will go, we will be in good shape to do a lot more than what we plan. Anything else? Okay. Moving on to policy subcommittee, Beth. Uh, the policy subcommittee met on Wednesday, March 1st um, in Connie's office. We discussed the open um, campus uh, request by the high school seniors, and we discussed um, placement at Pond Cove administrative guidelines um, and a few other policies that you will see in our first reading. And we will meet again on uh, Wednesday, March 29th, um, in Connie's office at 9.30. Okay. All right, the next is calendar committee. Connie, did you just want to? Just comment on that, or I just want to make note that we have started that process. It's a yearly process. It does involve, of course, um, discussion with the administrators, the school board, and with teachers. We had two teachers present at the meeting we had. We we started uh, one discussion we had um, was whether to start school before Labor Day. It was certainly the opinion of the teachers that that was that worked well for them. They liked having a running start on the year. Um, we also, of course, were concerned, however, about the construction. We don't know exactly where that's going to be. So our tentative uh, recommendation will be to have teachers have a workshop day before Labor Day and students come in after Labor Day. You will, however, receive that calendar at the April board meeting and have a chance to go over it. It won't expect you to vote on it at April. For those of you who are new board members, we usually adopt it in May. There is an advice in consult um, obligation with teachers, so we not only had them on the calendar committee, but we also make sure that it goes officially to the association, so if there are any questions on that, we can uh, 
uh, deal with it then. Okay. And I still believe in year-round schooling. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? It, as somebody who used to teach Latin, um, used to be a, a member of the Roman Senate who would, no matter what he was talking about, he ended it up with delenda est Catargo, and which means Carthage must be destroyed. And it didn't matter what he was talking about. And somebody said, you know what, well, he said, Carthage must go. And I'll, ultimately, in the Punic Wars, it did. So I, I've decided that's my delenda est Catargo. <laughs> Okay, that's my we'll indulge you. <laughs> classical <laughs> comment for the evening. All right, uh, moving on to unfinished business policies for a second reading. Beth? Um, there are a number of policies that there were minor changes made from the first reading. Um, my originals went to the nurses with my comments on them and didn't come back. So hopefully um, what was asked for is in line. I know that for the first aid one, we asked for more specific um, steps in the uh, bottom of the first page, and it looks like they were rewritten with um, other responsible adult will be called. They, I think there is more specificity there. I don't. I hope there's enough. The words in italics were the words added. The, the words. What? The words that are in italics are the words. Are the ones that they added. added. Carla. Um, I'd like to say that I'm not really happy with the words that were added there. The notes that I had, I pulled out my thing from last month, and the notes that I had written on the bottom of my old one for that number two down at the bottom, I had written in my own handwriting, if parents could not be reached, rescue would be called. And I don't know if I just wrote that down or if that's what we discussed. But in my memory, we discussed something a little more urgent than other responsible adult, because my feeling is if we're sitting here listing these specific kinds of things that can happen, and some of the ones listed there are really quite serious and potentially fatal, I it think, just makes me nervous that they... I think they covered themselves in the back page by saying any other extreme circumstances deemed necessary, necessary by the school administration in terms of when rescue would be called, basically whenever those listed, um, but I, I do. Probably technically that does cover it, but the way it's written, it's, I think it could be worded better. Personal. Well, that was the, that was the issue I had <clears throat> with number two. Um, I, I, I agree with Carla, I have the same issue with it, even though it is technically covered on the other, um, on the other side, it's so specific. You know, Everywhere maybe. else, and all of a sudden, it becomes other responsible adult. Um, whatever. Well, maybe we could add um, parents, other responsible adult, or rescue will be called, or res or put in the reverse order: parent rescue response. Who's the other responsible adult? There. I think it, I think it's referring to the one you put on your medical card. That if if you can't be reached, these are the people that. Are you those, like do those call. people though really expect to be called? Mm -hmm. um, for, for serious a medical serious emergency. medical emergency. I know, you know, when I give people's names and I just call and say, can, and I expect to get a call saying, um, I can't reach so-and-so and she, you know, has a headache and she needs to come home. I'll go pick them up, but I'm not sure I would be the one in a position to we, make that kind of decision. Yeah, and I agree with you. We did discuss clear. with the nurses at that meeting, you know, people need to inform their responsible adult what this involves, but I think you're exactly right there. I don't think uh, that's what people have in mind when they fill out those cards. In terms of a serious medical emergency, yes. they're, they're thinking of bringing in a change of clothes or you know, giving a kid a ride home, I think so. You know, I wonder if we should just is. lump that one in with number one, or maybe we shouldn't be listing so many specific little kinds of things that can happen here. I'm not sure two and three have to be there. Mm -hmm. Was, did, did this come from? Um, it came from suggested, no, sorry. I think part of it came from suggested language and part of it, um, you know, they, did, they definitely worked on. Um, but there was an old first aid policy that looks nothing like this. I mean, I think that if you have something um, like an allergic reaction that 
somebody needs to be called right away. Um, and I think that we're, I, I agree that I don't think we need two or three, that if we just had number one and, and that's life threatening, somebody should be called. I also think we should say parent and or guardian <clears throat> um, whenever we're talking about parents, because maybe people don't have, maybe they're living in a guardian situation versus their parents. But I, you know, it's, this is one of those situations where if it was my child, I wouldn't want anybody fooling around. I'd pay the med cube fee. fee. <laughs> I'd want them there if, if they feel that it's life-threatening within 20 minutes, let alone five, four or five. But I think medical attention should be something more than what our school nurses probably should do. It seems that part of the issue here is that <clears throat> um, it, it would be unusual for school personnel to make the decision without parent input as to whether or not somebody go to the hospital, that would require an emergency, obviously. Um, and perhaps what has happened here is that they're thinking about the next layer down where they really would want to notify the parent first, discuss whether or not, but you know, what's your sense from your, your child, perhaps an allergic reaction, what's the history of that, and so on. I think I understand what you're saying. I'd be happy to go back and discuss with the nurses. Um, it seems like the, what, what all the discussion we've had about this, this is a board that wants to make sure that rescue gets called if there's any real question at all. And the issue of calling before or after contacting parents is less important than doing what's appropriate right off. Um, and if that's what, what's the sticking point here, perhaps I can talk to the nurses and report back to you at the next Why, why not just change? In the first one, they say rescue will be called first, then parents notified mm -hmm. with the life-threatening thing. Right. Why not just switch that around in the, in the second one if you have to have the second one um, and say the parents will be notified, then rescue will be called if, you know, parents aren't If reached. necessary, yeah. I'm not sure what, where that line is. I, I would have to talk to them again. But the more I look at it, the, the more I feel that, that uh, it's really a, a non sequitur. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a certain kind of judgment that this is an, a serious emergency. Right. Uh, a rescue is called, mm -hmm. and the parent notification happens as fast as possible, but um, sometimes you just have to make that decision on the spot, so. Because there, there's some of the same, well, for instance, profuse bleeding appears in both right. one and yeah. two, and I just think it's just it's And a compound fracture can also be, could be something that needs to be treated right away. Right. 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 I do think the three needs to be in there, and I can only insist that it be in there because of my own past experience. Oh, I know there have been. Because I've had, parents, I've had children come home with these type of things, and we haven't even been notified right. that there was an accident or that the child was injured. I think they're a lot better for, in my experience. I seem to get a call about <laughs> everything, um, which but is if, fine. But if I'd we're looking at a first aid, I would habit. like to have it in there as a policy yeah. that, it, that this way you can always say, well, it is a policy that you call. Right. right. It, it really seems as if two is redundant. If it has any meaning, it's hard to figure out what mm -hmm. it is. It's, it's, it's putting a lot of onus on the nurse to make it. really a, is. Yeah. Because yeah. to a child who's going through an allergic reaction, it could be like we had a high school student a couple of years ago, or three years ago, who had an allergic reaction, not in the school, but I mean, mm. oh, that's right. yeah. and it was a very simple thing. Yeah. Right. But right. it was yeah. life-threatening. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, would right. you like to take it back to the nurses, or would you like to eliminate two and change one if life-threatening or needing immediate medical attention, you know, rescue and parents are called? I think you could combine them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And add guardian. Yeah. Guardian. Well, actually, I feel like every time it says parent, I'm assuming parent and guardian, so maybe we need to go through the... Most of the assumption in here is if it says parent, it also means whoever the child's guardian is if they don't have a parent. Um. But I, I think they do need to think about that concept that you call whoever's on the card. I know it says emergency card on it, but you know that's a major responsibility you're putting on parents that I don't think they've thought through. I don't think that's well, I, I know that the nurses are concerned about that. They said because parents put on those emergency cards, people that aren't even ever home or around that if their child, you know, that it is, you know, certainly an issue, an education piece with them, and we right. did discuss that. 
Don't we also have in those cards sort of next, nearest relative, which isn't necessarily who the neighbor who you'd call if I'm not sure it down. gets that far down the line. I, I, yeah. At my work, I separate those two things because if you yeah. take, yeah. I mean, a neighbor can't take your child to the hospital and right. expect it to be treated, but if granny shows up with them. No, I can it tell you that if granny shows up no. with them, unless no. you have have a, note. Have, have a note from mom, it doesn't work. But if it's on, <laughs> if that's what our, have discovered that's that. what our form should enable us to do. Right say this is a person who can take my child to the hospital. I wouldn't ask a neighbor yeah. to put themselves in that situation. No. No. It's, it sounds to me like one of those things we talk about having information for parents at the beginning of the school year. And this sounds like another topic that we need to make sure we think through and, and remind people about those kinds of issues. We definitely discussed that and they, yes, we they were aware yeah. of that. Um, would you like to leave this one or combine those two in a <laughs> Since this is the second reading, I would like to move that we table it okay. for third reading. The other ones, I think. Yeah. I have moved. Let's, yeah, let's take care of that. Oh, second. second. Okay. Any discussion? Yeah, could I just comment yes. that if we're going to combine it, maybe we should get rid of these time limits, like the four to five minutes and the 20 to 30 minutes, and just use the wording of life threatening or needing immediate medical attention and get away from those little times. Why don't I let the nurses see how they want to put it okay, together? Okay, because they, they really have taken care of it by, de by saying who's going to make the determination mm -hmm. that you're going to take a certain action. And I don't think that, you know, putting four or five minutes versus 20 or 30 is, okay. um, it requires them to stop and, you know, think about something you'd rather that they see they're in an emergency room. Right? Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. hope we can get through the other ones fast. I know, I'm sorry. The other ones I think were much clearer. I could see where the changes were made. Um, if you look at file uh, JHCA, we asked that, um, what was the word we had in enterers. there? Enterers. Enterers was changed to enrollees. We added sixth grade because some sixth graders uh, yeah, participate in uh, sports. And I think that was it for physical exams. The changes were asked. Any questions on that one before I go on? The um, file JHCB, immunization of students. Um, I don't think there were any changes. No changes. No changes. Thank you, Connie. Um, file JHCC, communicable diseases. We had them put in, you see in writing, those um, notifiable communicable diseases as identified by the state health department um, to clarify that. And that list does change periodically of what they decide are those diseases. And administering medicines to students, JHCD. I think there was nothing there. Typos were in some of them that we were going to they'll take. They'll be fixed when it's retyped. Yeah, they'll be fixed when they're typed. Are there any questions on those? I'd like to make a motion then that we accept the policies JHCA, JHCB, JHCC, JHCD for a second reading. Second. For adoption. For adoption. Oh, right. okay, did you second it, Gail? Yeah. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. Okay. Yes. Moving on to uh, policies. policies first, first reading. reading. Um, the only policy we have tonight is the weapons in the school, and it is a sample and required policy. Um, we took it exactly from the um, suggested language. We thought about changing some or cutting some out, and we just couldn't quite figure out which part should go and stay, and that there was nothing that was um, different from what we would do in this kind of situation. So it is all um, exactly what came from them. Have the administrators looked at these? 
I don't know. They weren't in our meeting. Packets, but we haven't that, yeah. discussed it in any detail. My, you know, my feeling reading this is these are so poorly and obscurely written. Um, I think they're really hard, especially the administrative implementation procedures are just <laughs> kind of, maybe it's just me, tell me if it's me. Well, we, we definitely they, discussed, couldn't we just put in the very top part and keep it really simple? And then as we went through, we just, there were little pieces that, um, I, I would really like to see the administrators look at this and just, you know, think of it in terms of their what procedures they already have in place, and let's just, you know, make sure we've got everything we legally need to, and and maybe rewrite this in in some way that that sounds more like us, because um, right now, <laughs> it just, uh, I, I find it very hard to follow. And if I was going to give this to a parent and say, um, you know, this is what we're going to do to your kid, I think they'd say. You know, what? I don't under I don't understand this policy. We are required by law to have it. Well, I th and think we should work on it quickly. Then. There right. are certain um, what we have to do if we're going to rewrite it. There were certain specific clauses that were also required to have, like the <coughs> guideline that number C. It's it said that we are specifically required by law to have that written down. So we have to make sure if we're going to rewrite it in our own language that we retain the parts. That we they, have they, to you have. have to use those specific yeah. phrases. Mm -hmm. No, but we have to have somewhere in the policy that we Something would refer to a law enforcement agency. Right. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to have that particular phrase, but we have to make sure we have that idea or concept in there. Right. I mean, we may in fact go farther than that now. Um, who knows? But I, that's, that's what we, why I we think thought, sort of thought we right. already did. Yeah. Um, well, I just think it should be in line with what we do if we need to. Tough enough what we do, fine. If this isn't tough enough, I don't think we should lower what we're doing to the to this standard. So. Well, unfortunately, this is an issue that illustrates the desperation that is felt in many schools throughout this country. Yeah. Well. And the uh, reason why it's required is that it's part of the Goals 2000 legislation. Uh, of course, as we speak, that's being voted on, I guess, in the House of Representatives or at some point this week, um, where money, I mean, what's happened, we've had almost a total change from one administration to the next as to how regulations will be handled. However, I have seen nothing to lead me to believe that they aren't going to want to have uh, the stiffest possible penalty for bringing a firearm. The crux of this issue is that where it says any student who is determined to have brought a firearm as defined in 18 U.S.C. Section 921. <laughs> That's what I mean. And I mean, I'm not exactly sure what's in that section, so I don't know exactly what's covered. Apparently not a, a piece of wood that's painted to look like a gun. To school will be expelled from the regular school program for at least one year. I mean, this is, I heard um, an administrator from Rochester, uh, New York talk probably two years ago about the fact that as an administrator in the school system, he couldn't automatically suspend a student for bringing a gun to school. There had to be evidence that the student intended to use the gun. So I think that the background of the, uh, something that reads as stringently as this does and in such detail is the background of a situation that is so out of control that an administrator can't immediately suspend, to say nothing of expel, a student for having brought a gun to school. So that, I think, is the background of this kind of thing. I agree with you. It does seem like overkill, but I don't know exactly what to. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not talking about the content, per se. I don't think we should have weapons in the school. No. It's just so, you know, it's just so poorly written that I, that I think it loses its effectiveness. So if we could just rewrite it. And, you know, I do think we have had kids bring things to school that were not intended to be used in a nice way. So I think we need the policy, maybe not, you know, in quite, maybe it's not quite as bad as other places, but oh, no, I there think are plenty we, of yeah. school systems in Maine who are having, That's right. starting to have these problems. So. That's right. No, I think we do need to spell out, and it lists here for the administrators, particularly firearms, ammunition, explosives, brass knuckles, switchblades, butterfly knives, chains, clubs, and Kung Fu stars. And I know some of these things have come into us. Yeah, that's, yeah. I know they've been brought to school. Yeah. So, 
next? Uh, why don't we talk this over administratively <laughs> and we'll be ready for the next policy subcommittee. Um, and uh, it, let's make sure that we have, you know, something we can give you for feedback. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else on that? All right, moving on to nominations for spring athletic fee coaching positions. And you have a list in your packet. Varsity softball, Janet Hoskin. Assistant softball, Marjorie Queen. Varsity baseball, Scott Shea. JV baseball, Kevin Adams. Varsity lacrosse, Charlie Birch. Assistant lacrosse, John Bayreiter. JV lacrosse, Ben Raymond. Boys tennis, Andy Strout. Assistant boys tennis, Jim Littrop Capes. Please help me out. Capetes. They should have asked you in listening. advance. I'm sorry. I beg your pardon, Jim. Assistant girls tennis, Sue Ray. Boys track, Scott Hendry. Girls track, Ray Cooper. Assistant track, Larry Greer. And two assistant tracks part time, and I'm assuming that that's splitting those uh, positions Bill Rice and Anna Struck. That's the list. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the superintendent's nominations for athletic fee positions for spring 95. So moved. Okay. Any discussion? Carla? <laughs> I just would like to say that, just very briefly, that this is the kind of thing that I think that we can scrutinize greatly for our budget discussions that we're ongoing right now in terms of next year. Some of the issues that are going to come up Thursday night when we're discussing Ponco, for instance, when I see a list like this, with so many athletic positions, so many assistant positions, so many JV positions, I would need to have this intensely justified for another budget year. So that's just my two cents worth right now. Anybody else? Okay, all in favor? Seven zero. All right, there being no. I'd like to make one comment. The only thing with the, with the high school athletic program and the middle school is a high participation rate, and we as a system have to decide is that priority or there is it's 80 percent participation throughout the year and um, of all students, so, and uh, and the particip participation rate in the middle school is is as high. It's certainly something we can discuss in the right. budget. Okay, Aaron. No further business. Um, we're going to adjourn this meeting and have our school budget workshop on the on community services and district-wide accounts. <laughs>